My name is Hallie Nicholson, and I just wanted to welcome you to our staff town hall today. We've got a great group of panelists on hand to uh, provide some updates on our operations during COVID-19 and to answer your questions. Some of the questions that were submitted today were submitted during registration, and you can also feel free to use the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen to submit additional questions for our panelists. Due to our time limitations, we won't be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log them as they come in and post answers on the Return to Learn website. Our webinar today has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. You can also click on the link that's posted in the chat. So now I'd like to introduce Chancellor Pradeep Khosla for some welcoming remarks. So thanks again, Pradeep, and take it away. Thank you, Ali, and uh, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, we are a few weeks away from the start of our fall quarter, and I can tell you our campus is ready. I know many of you are also very ready to come back to work. We are carefully monitoring the Delta variant, and we continue to update campus safety protocols in response to this dynamic situation. And we are confident that our return to learn strategy will continue to perform well, just like it did last year. We have added the UC vaccine mandate to our strategy, and full compliance, as you know, is required by September 6th. So if you're already vaccinated, <clears throat> thank you very much. And if you're not fully vaccinated, I urge you to do so. It is free, it is easy to schedule, and it is quick. Vaccination is our number one defense against serious illness. And masking is our number one defense against transmission. So everywhere, everyone, regardless of the vaccine status, must wear a mask indoors at all UC San Diego locations. Exceptions are when eating and drinking and when alone in a closed office. Masks are also not required outdoors, but are strongly encouraged. Daily symptom screening is helping us track viral activity and everyone coming to campus must continue to complete the daily symptom screener. Also helping us track viral activity is asymptomatic testing. Students are required to test prior to move in and they will also test on day five and day 10 after move in. And we will share more information about ongoing asymptomatic testing very soon. Wastewater monitoring, our hallmark, will continue throughout the campus uh, during this year. Those living and working in buildings that receive a positive wastewater signal will require to test. And we have made a decision to postpone all indoor events or shift them to a virtual format through the end of October. Masks may be required at outdoor events at the discretion of the event organizers. And we will continue to assess and adapt our safety protocols based on data and evolving science. We will continue to be successful because of you, our faculty, and our students. And thank you all for your continued, commit, uh, continued commitment to safety. And Hallie, I'm gonna turn this back to you. All right, thank you very much, Pretty. So let's get started with our presentation. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, and he's gonna give us an update on the medical side of things for COVID-19 and the vaccine. So Chip, take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief update about where things are with epidemic, make a few comments about the, uh, the vaccines uh, and uh, boosters, and uh, then move on to other people uh, on the panel. I think these data are quite well known to everyone. We're in the middle of kind of surge number three in the US uh, with an increase in the number of cases that has uh, taken off since the uh, first part of July. Next slide. The surge has been concentrated in the Southeastern United States and other parts of the country where the um, vaccine penetration has been lowest, uh, places like Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Uh, California has had a mini surge, uh, but as I'll show you in a few minutes, places like San Diego seem to be turning it around uh, over the last few weeks. Next slide. So what accounted for this? Uh, you can see that uh, things in uh, San Diego uh, were very similar uh, overall to what we were seeing nationally, uh, a big surge over the course of the winter. Things are looking really good in the spring and early summer, very few cases. But we've had a rise in cases that began uh, in the late uh, part of June and early July, next slide, shortly after the arrival of the Delta variant. Uh, the Delta variant um, uh, is, uh, arrived here in San Diego in early April, and it accounts for virtually all of the cases of um, COVID on our campus and indeed in San Diego. Next slide. 
What is it about the Delta variant uh, that has caused uh, us the most trouble? First of all, it grows more rapidly than the earlier strains of the virus, which allows it to get to higher levels in the lungs and the nose. And that makes it both more infectious uh, and able to get around uh, to the um, in epidemiologic situations in which earlier strains of the virus would not have been able to be transmitted. And it uh, causes more serious disease. Next slide. What you can see in the next slide uh, is that uh, the, in the blue box, uh, this new uh, Delta variant is about as contagious as chickenpox. Chickenpox, uh, as many of you uh, may remember, uh, who are my age, was one of the more um, communicable childhood diseases. The only one that was more communicable was measles. And if you were in a classroom as a fourth grader and someone walked in with chickenpox and you hadn't had it, chances are very good you'd pick it up. And that's very much what we're seeing uh, with the Delta variant, uh, which is um, accounting for the fact that things we were doing in the spring and early summer to slow the spread have not been as successful and it required us to double down. Next slide. The good news is that when you're vaccinated, uh, the Delta variant, which can rise to high enough levels to be transmitted in the first few days of your illness. Now this slide is oriented in a way that green dots are uh, depict the amount of virus uh, in someone's nose. If they uh, were vaccinated and had the Delta variant, the red dots are unvaccinated people. And you can see for the first couple of days, the levels of virus are very similar. What you can also see uh, is that over the course of the uh, next week or so, uh, things decline relatively rapidly in people who were vaccinated and people who were not vaccinated in red continue to shed virus for a longer period of time and therefore are more infectious. Next slide. Uh, the vaccine uh, situation is really a quite good one now. We have now a fully approved vaccine from Pfizer uh, that uh, was approved uh, early last week for anyone 16 and older and is still available under an emergency use authorization for uh, people as young as 12. Two other vaccines, one made by Moderna and another one by Johnson & Johnson are also available for adults, still under an EUA, but being reviewed by the FDA uh, under uh, for full approval as we speak. Next slide. What we've been hearing most about lately are booster shots. Uh, we're definitely gonna need booster shots. Uh, and there are two reasons for this. The first of this is that uh, booster shots, uh, is that immunity to coronavirus viruses decline over time, just like with all other infections. And we're seeing that in people who are vaccinated early on. And what's happening is that these people are becoming uh, infected, uh, but they're really uh, unlikely to become uh, any more ill than, a, than having a, a flu-like illness. Uh, this, um, if you're vaccinated, you have about seven times less of a chance of getting infected than the unvaccinated population, but over 30 times less chance of being sick enough to get into the hospital. These breakthrough infections are important because they continue to allow the virus to spread in our community. And they also allow the virus to infect people who are um, not as uh, well vaccinated uh, because of their un underlying immunosuppressive conditions and those who have chosen not to be vaccinated yet. So it's really important to also tamp down these breakthrough infections, which is why we've been hearing about these booster shots. Uh, people who are immunocompromised are already receiving them. And as we speak, there's a meeting of the uh, CDC's uh, immunization panel uh, that will be making a decision today, recommendations about uh, how soon uh, vaccination should be offered to the rest of us. Earlier, they were thinking about eight months. It may be as, as soon as six months after the first vaccination that the general population uh, is um, going to be recommended to be boosted. Next slide. Now, the important thing is that vaccination is only one thing that is keeping us safe on our campus. We've adapted the Swiss cheese model and all the things we had present last year are still here. These include uh, lots of testing as Dr. Uh, as uh, Chancellor Koshla mentioned. We have lots of quarantine and isolation housing available for any students who become isolated. We have uh, HR policies allow people to stay home for people who need to be stay home because of exposure or infection. Uh, Cal California Notify is something you put on your phone to be notified for someone uh, if you're near someone who's been infected. And uh, we're going to be wearing face covering. So with all these things in place, monitoring wastewater, uh, in, in addition, uh, the campus is going to be quite a safe place to be uh, over the course of the next few months, uh, Delta or not. 
Next slide. As I mentioned, things in San Diego are getting to be a bit uh, better. If you look in the middle panel uh, down below the blue bars, you can see the uh, those are the student cases uh, in dark blue on campus and light blue off campus. You can see over the last several weeks, uh, as indeed all last semester, most of the infections among our students were off campus students. But you can see over the last week or so, the number of cases has been gradually declining. And on the right, uh, you can see that in our employees, the number of new infections among employees, which are running four to eight a day uh, back a week or 10 days ago, are now down to two or three a day reflecting what uh, we think is going on in the vaccinated population in San Diego. Very pleased to say that uh, we have about 85% of our campus employees have already been vaccinated, about 90% of, uh, of the health employees, so we're making really good progress on, on vaccination. And the last slide uh, just shows you uh, what I alluded to earlier, and that is if you look over on the right, you can see in the um, the number of students on campus and off campus, the number of the case rates have been declining for about 10 days, as has the overall county rate in the dark, uh, in the uh, dark boxes, uh, has been gradually declining for about the last week. So fingers are crossed that we're beginning to see the crest of the Delta outbreak here, beginning to get ahead of it again with uh, the more attention to masking and a cumulative effect of vaccination. So let me stop here and turn it back over to Hallie and I look forward to having some chance to talk to all of you. Thank you. All right, thanks a bunch, Chip, for all that information. So next up, we're going to hear about the UC vaccine policy and some information about return to campus from my HR colleague, Terry Winbush, Senior Director of Labor Relations and Employee Relations. Terry is also going to be joined by another HR colleague, Amanda Chavez, Senior Labor Relations Analyst. So take it away. Thank you, Hallie. So as many of you know, and uh, has been alluded to earlier, there is uh, a UC vaccine mandate. And so the compliance timeline is almost upon us. Uh, so remember, if you are requesting an exception or a deferral to the UC vaccine mandate, that needs to be received uh, no later than September 2nd. So that means you need to log on to that Qualtrics survey that's on the, um, the webpage and submit your information so that the information can be transmitted to our third party administrator, Sedgwick. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, related to full compliance, um, we need everyone to have submitted their information and engage with the process no later then September 2nd, so that we know when we start logging on to that supervisor dashboard that I'll be talking about um, on September 6th and September 7th, for those who don't work on Labor Day, we will know that our folks are uh, engaged and compliant with the process and that there's no other additional um, requirements that we need to um, adjust as it relates to that. So if you need additional time, for example, you're awaiting to see, receive your second dose or something like that, Work with your supervisor, work with your HR contact so that we know that if you show as non-compliant what the status is and what your time frame is, uh, so we know how to engage with you. Um, if you have questions about how to provide your proof of vaccination, uh, meaning you need help with engaging with the uh, MyChart, um, our uh, health colleagues have been really uh, helpful um, through our uh, UC COVID vaccine mandate responsible office. So you can email them at sdvaxro at health.ucsd.edu and they will assist you. Additionally, for those of you who have submitted exceptions, I know it's very, very frustrating. It's very frustrating for us as well. You've submitted your request through uh, Qualtrics. You've heard nothing. Some of you submitted a request again. You heard nothing. So what I can say to you is if you've already submitted your request, you do not need to submit it again. If you're wondering whether your request went through, you can email that sdvaxro at health.ucsd.edu and they can confirm that you're on the list. Cedric has had some uh, delays in processing, not because they process slowly, but because there were some things going on behind the scenes as far as um, the documentation that they would need to send to you all that they hadn't received fully yet. So now that they have all that information, they should be reaching out saying, A, we have your request and it will be processed in order of receipt. And then B, they'll be reaching out to actually um, have you fill out the necessary forms that are required for the type of exception or deferral that you've requested so that they can engage that process. And don't worry uh, for, the, for those of you who um, have submitted those requests and say, well, then I'm gonna show up as non-compliant. 
Don't fret, we have a process in place. Uh, next slide. So this is a preview of what the supervisor dashboard will look like. Look, look like. So supervisors each day will need to log on to um, this dashboard to see the status of the compliance status of the folks who directly report to them. So if you have indirect reports, they will roll up through their direct report only, not to indirect reports as well. You have to be on VPN for those of you who are offsite and not uh, uh, on uh, UC San Diego site on the network, you'll have to VPN to access this dashboard. But once you do that, you log in and you'll be able to see everybody that re directly reports to you and you'll be able to see their compliance status. What, there's legend information there for you that explains to you. So if you see someone is green or purple, if they're green or purple, there's no additional action at this time since everyone is engaging in the indoor masking as noted before. For someone who shows is not compliant, they may not be in a problematic position yet. So this is why we say, if the employee shows as non-compliant, reach out to your local HR to determine if any additional action is required. Your local HR will then interface with uh, members of central HR or central AP to review and determine if there's a processing uh, timeline that we're waiting on from Sedgwick, if there are other things in place, if the person um, is in a circumstance where they don't have to engage in the compliance process, either they're on leave or something like that, but we will assist um, the local HRs, uh, HR units in facilitating this. So you as a supervisor should not immediately engage with your employee just because you see that they show as non-compliant. It just means an additional step is necessary for you as a supervisor to reach out to your local HR contact to figure out next steps. And we will assist along the way. We will have templates and all of that and all of the instructions on how to log on to this and all of that will be uh, uh, posted on Blink sites uh, in the coming days so that when you are ready to take a look at this uh, come Monday, uh, you will know what to do, how to engage, and then who to connect with uh, with your questions. Um, uh, I think that's it on the dashboard. So next slide. So the other thing that we want folks to remember, because we've gotten a lot of questions lately that um, remind us to about a year ago when, when we all were first remote in the first couple of months. And what do I do if someone is exposed? What do I do if this happens? Or how do I go get tested? Things of that nature. And so it's, it's really one of those back to basics timelines uh, for folks, especially those that are adjusting to returning back to being on site. So remember that you have to give your chance, yourself a chance to settle in. And for those of our colleagues who have been on site this entire time, please show us grace as we start to encroach back into your space, right? You all know how to do this. You know how to wear your masks every time you go anywhere to the bathroom, whatever. We don't. We're at our houses. When we go to the restroom, we don't tend to grab our mask. So um, for those out there who don't nerd out like me uh, and wear a lanyard with my mask around my neck so I <laughs> never forget it, uh, and I have my kids doing it too. Yes, pray for them. Uh, for those of you who don't want to do that, just give yourself an extra beat before you take a step out of your office, out of your cubicle, whatever the case may be, and make sure you always have your mask because you want to have it on whenever you're indoors, right? And it's not necessarily intuitive if you've been working at, a, at your desk, at your home, or somewhere offsite this entire time. So for those of you who have been on, been on site, please, please, please show us grace. Um, but engage with our websites. Uh, go back to the HR um, Blink page. Make sure you scroll through those return to learn pages to remember on how to get access to testing. Uh, for those of you who are not fully vaccinated and you'll have an exception, um, an exemption or a deferral to the vaccine mandate, you'll need to be testing twice weekly. So remember how to do that, how to get, engage with the vending machines to get tested. Um, for those of you who are fully vaccinated who want to get tested um, once per week, even though not mandated, you still can test for your pod like we did last year. So remember how to engage with that process if you want. Remember, you still have to do your daily symptom and exposure screening. And supervisors, you need to check it. Do not get lax in that. Now the dashboard is gonna incorporate that information, 
But I need you all to know that when we in HR are looking at this information and, and we see someone who has symptom screened um, as not being allowed on site, but we find out that they're on site because a supervisor hasn't checked, that's going to be the supervisor's problem as well as the employee's problem, because we all, as a part of that Swiss cheese model, have responsibilities to engage in this process to make sure that the campus remains safe. Um, remember, we do have our COEM, that's our Center, Center for Occupational and Environmental Medicine, our wonderful doctors and, um, and nurses and physicians over there helping us figure out this entire process. Remember, we still have a robust contact tracing um, process if there is an exposure for those of you who return to on-site and if you see your location on that daily dashboard because I know you're checking it because those emails go out every day and I know you're not ignoring them you're reading them and then you see oh my building had an exposure to someone don't fret remember to go back to those blink pages you can go and get tested just to be sure but remember the contact tracers will reach out to you if you did have an actual exposure with the individual person as well. So remember all of that. Remember, we still have leaves available at least through September 30th and probably longer for the Cal OSHA leave um, so that your pay is protected if you have an exposure and we have to keep you from being off site and you can't work uh, remotely uh, due to that. So there are a number of things in place to continue our Swiss cheese model to keep things safe. Remember, if you don't know exactly what to do, talk with your supervisor, talk with your local HR contact. We're all here to help you figure it out and just take it one step at a time because everyone is engaging in some form of an adjustment every day. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Amanda to take over from here. So in addition to the items that Terry mentioned, uh, there's also the work location status tool that we'd love for you to update before you come back on site, but also if you're remaining off site for the time being, please update that as well, because as Terry showed on the dashboard, it'll be really helpful. But there's also some very important training that you take before returning on site. So for those of you that have been hybrid or are working on site now, you have probably taken the COVID training. There's a second uh, bridge training that you'll need to complete if you have not done so already, which you can find on the UC Learning Center. And for those that are newly returning to site or have not taken the training yet, please make sure that you go on to the UC Learning Center and complete the mandatory COVID training prior to returning on site. We also want to make sure you know about the resources we have for you. So we know there's a lot of information coming from a lot of different places. So the return to learn desk is available with the email address there you see, rtl at ucsd.edu. They're there for the information that you may think to look at the return to learn site from. So your vaccine appointment scheduling, if you need to schedule that appointment, symptom screening, testing information, information for the entire UC San Diego community, as well as visitors is available on the return to learn site. If you have questions about you as a staff member returning to site, or if you're a supervisor returning your employees to site, the RTC support desk, return to campus support desk, is available for any questions you may have about returning on site, flexible work arrangements, the work location status form, and anything related to returning to campus. Environment, Health and Safety also has a return to campus email address and team that's supporting uh, that process. So they are available to respond to questions around masking, around events and gatherings, as well as sanitation of spaces. Uh, additionally, if there's any questions when you do return on site about um, the safety of the space or uh, other concerns, they're your go-to in terms of risk and ensuring kind of a safe uh, environment. And then as Terry mentioned, Mentioned earlier, we have the UC San Diego COVID vaccine office that can help, help with any questions related to your compliance with the vaccine mandate. Uh, so thank you and please reach out if you need anything from our team. All right, thanks so much, Terry and Amanda. Thank you. All right, so next up, I'd like to welcome Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Allison Satterland and Executive Director of Special Events and Protocol, Jill Townsend, and they're gonna give us an update on event guidelines and planning. So take it away. 
Thanks, Holly. I think my good partner, Jill, is going to take the first couple of slides, and then I'm going to provide some information around uh, compliance tools that might help our event planners and, and our friends around the campus. Thank you both. Um, first up, we want to go ahead and define um, what events are. I think that there's been some confusion between if it's an event, if it's a meeting. Um, so we've taken a, an attempt here to make this a little bit easier on all of us um, by putting some uh, guardrails around this a little bit. Uh, and you'll see here in front of you that an event is um, any planned gathering at a UC San Diego location. And you'll see a laundry list of things, um, but not limited to celebrations, dances, lectures, et cetera. And um, an important note here is under 25 people, excuse me, over 25 people, rather, events are over 25 people um, or more in attendance or an expectation that there would be more than 25 people in attendance. Events do not include academic classes or seminars, department meetings, laboratory meetings, or other routine business meetings. And then uh, the other question that we get asked all the time is what is a meeting? And that's referring to employees, including academics, or students gathering for the purposes of day-to-day -day business operations. Um, I would add at this point that if you are in a place where you're still a little bit confused by this, um, perhaps taking the road that is on the more conservative side would be the better choice at this time. Next slide. And I'm gonna invite Allison to jump in on this whenever she would like. Um, so here are a few updates on some of our new event um, guidelines at this time. So I've mentioned events or anything, 25 people, 25 persons are over. All of those need to be um, registered via the events and activities intake form that can be found on the campus events and activities portal page. Um, and the link is there. And outdoor events are permitted at this time. However, indoor events through October 31st are permitted by vice chancellor exception. And those would be approved via the form that I just mentioned a moment ago. Allison, did you wanna add anything here? You know, I think what I would offer Jill is uh, towards the point you made earlier to be a little bit more conservative with the planning um, but but to really utilize the outdoor uh, environment, uh, particularly for events that build community and we know are so critical to the in-person work experience and the in-person student experience um, as well. So please consider utilizing um, our beautiful campus and, and let our uh, event planning leads, particularly Jill Townsend and, and Sharon Von Bruggen, um, let them guide you and provide some um, some suggestions for you as well. It may be spaces that you haven't utilized before that would be a good match for you, uh, particularly in the, the current uh, public health environment. Great, thank you. And I apologize if you hear a dog in the background, trash can day, and we know what that does to dogs. Um, so the approval process on this form that we're asking everyone to fill out um, is the form runs through Kuali. And to expedite the process, you'll see a note here that we're asking event planners to ask their level one approver to watch for an email from no reply at mail.qualibill.com. Um, sometimes these come in and they might come across as looking like spam because quality is still relatively new to the campus and not everyone's familiar with this form. So sending a note from you to your approver is really helpful. If I can have the next slide, please. Here are the approval pathways. Um, so for, uh, to provide a level of transparency for you here in case you're unaware at this time. Um, the host type, excuse me, the host type is um, broken down. These are the five areas right now. And so you would fall into one of these. Um, if you have questions about this or figure that you don't fall into that, you can go to, um, the website that I mentioned on the previous slide and submit a question from there and we'd be happy to help you find the right spot. Um, so level zero approvers, or if someone's putting this in and um, in place of the event planner, it would first route to the planner. Level one then typically goes to the department head or similar. And then finally, we'll end up at level two um, for the divisional area vice chancellor or the um, EDC of academic affairs. And Allison, I believe the next slide is yours. Yes, thank you, Jill. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the next few slides provide an overview of the modified symptom screener that we're hoping will be helpful to our event planners, um, as well as our um, uh, team members who will be advising students in person, for example, um, or working um, in an, another student facing um, a unit or operation. Our good partners in IT are working to integrate the COVID-19 vaccine mandate policy and the related compliance options into the daily symptom screener. So you'll see when a student is fully in uh, compliance with the vaccine, as well as a student who has indicated that they do not have any symptoms and are cleared for campus. You'll also see when there are no symptoms, but the student is out of compliance, um, either with the, the testing expectations related to an exception, or they themselves have not completed the COVID-19 mandate uh, requirement, uh, or we're in the process of reviewing the request for the exemption, and the uh, symptom screener does not reflect the completion of that process yet. It's so complicated as we add both the testing compliance, symptom screening, as well as the COVID-19 vaccine mandate policy compliance to the symptom screener, but we really are working to create a tool that's inclusive and easy to use and will be helpful to all of you who are um, interfacing with students or managing events as well. Next slide, please. So again, here, uh, another example of um, some symptoms in compliance with the uh, policy or some symptoms not in compliance with the policy. Next slide, please. And then what we hope that uh, very few of us will see uh, uh, symptoms and, and no compliance or symptoms and um, no compliance with the vaccine mandate. This should be rolled out in the next uh, week or so, again, in advance of the fall um, kickoff and full opening of the academic year. And I wanna thank our IT partners who've been working um, very um, rigorously to make sure that we have this tool available to us and that honoring all of the, the privacy and, and, and HIPAA uh, compliance matters as well. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you all this year and Jill and I are happy to be a resource. Thank you, Hallie. Uh, now it's back to you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Allison and Jill. So for our final presentation, before we move into our Q&A, we're gonna do something slightly different. So looking ahead to um, welcoming students back for the fall quarter and for many staff who, who's, uh, might be going back to return um, to some on-site work. We're gonna have a special spotlight on one of our newest campus dining options, Blue Bowl. So I'd now like to invite Teague Savage, co-founder of Blue Bowl, and Craig Edelman, co-owner of Blue Bowl, to share some information. Hey everyone, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, Teague is on here as well. Um, but I'll be starting out and then I'll pass it over to Teague as well. Um, but we are Blue Bull. Both Teague and I are, are co-owners of, of the company. Um, and we are a small chain of superfood cafes in Southern California. So we actually have six locations in uh, the LA and Orange County um, where we began. Um, but we are, have just launched um, about a month and a half ago. Um, our seventh location on the campus at UCSD. Um, and we are, I can't tell you how excited that we are to be opening this location on campus, um, particularly because of our backstory. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a shot from about 17 years ago, of Teague and I, um, somewhere near campus, both, both of us actually met um, on campus at UCSD. Um, we were actually knew of each other in, in high school. We were both rivals in water polo. Um, we both were on competing teams and played each other in state championships um, together, but knew each other from the pool and then actually met as, as and became very close friends um, on campus at UCSD. Um, so basically now, you know, 15 years later after we since graduated, um, we're, we're back um, on campus and, and bringing, you know, our, our business uh, to you all and, and all the students. So we just honestly couldn't be more thrilled to be back on campus. Both Teague and I were absolutely giddy when we were first looking at, at the location and, and, and checking out the opportunity. Um, so next slide, please. So what is Blue Bowl? Um, so a lot of people probably know of an acai bowl. Um, we are a 
100% customizable acai and other superfood uh, bowl concept. Um, we like to say, you know, if you're going to do something, do it really well. And that thing for us is the bowl. Um, we, that is the main component of our menu. We'll talk about a few other menu items as well. Um, but that is our focus. That is our bread and butter. Um, and we have more than just acai. We have other superfood bases that we've created from scratch, which I'll talk about as well. But basically what we are is an opportunity to build your own bowl. So you start with your basic by choosing your size. You choose the bases that you want from acai to pataya to gold to huckleberry to matcha, whatever you'd like to do. Um, and you build your bowl from there going into fresh nut butters that we make in house to fresh fruit, strawberries, blueberries, bananas, um, apples, et cetera. And then adding a number of um, fantastic toppings on top of that. Um, and, and we don't upcharge for anything. So we really believe in customization and, you know, there's no like $2.50 block here. Um, if you want extra almond butter, we put it on there. If you want extra blueberries, we're putting it on there. So we're, we just want to give a great product at a fixed price and not upcharge for anything. We want people to feel that freedom of building the bolt that they want. Um, and so that is kind of the, the, the basis of our, our product. Um, I, you can go on to the next slide actually, which I just basically have kind of laid out some of our bases. Um, so we're not just an acai concept, although, you know, many people, are, it is our most popular base. So I would recommend it. Um, all of our bases we've actually built from scratch. So we've built the recipes, we've, um, we produced them. Um, we care a lot about integrity and quality of product and high quality ingredients. Um, so every single product that you, you know, every single base that you see there, um, we've, we've kind of been a part of building. So from our acai um, to our patai, which is a dragon fruit gold, which is a cold pressed juice of man uh, mango, carrot, um, orange, passion fruit, turmeric. Um, so just, just to give you guys a sense of, of, of some of the different products we have, we're very well known for our, our blue bowl chia, which we also make in house, which is a chia pudding that people layer on top. So you can kind of see from the, the, the pictures here, there's a lot of ways to build a blue bowl. Um, and we really like, we love, you know, customers to be able to kind of choose how they want to build it. Um, and, and I will also say that we are 100% vegan concept. So every single product that you'll see in our stores is plant-based. Um, everything from our bases to our chia pudding to our, um, we don't serve bee honey and we have other replacements. Um, we are a kind of a, a breakfast, lunch and dinner concept or mid-afternoon snack or post-workout snack. So people use us for a number of things. Um, I think that's why we've been able to, you know, be successful, successful so far in the LA and Orange County area. Um, and because I think people use us for so, such a variety of, of, you know, different times of the day or use cases, but, um, it, it definitely can be a full meal as you can see from the size of some of these bowls. Um, and I want, while I'm here, actually going to pass it on to Teague in a second. I do want to just give one hit, uh, one tip. So kind of a pro tip for me is I always put live almond butter on my bowls. So you'll see in our, our stores when you, when you go, or if you go, um, that we have fresh made nut butter that we make every day. Um, I always get that live from the machine. So you add the fresh butter over the base. Um, it just, it comes up nice and warm and completely fresh. And I put it on my bowl every single time. So if that's of interest to you, just ask um, one of our team members that you'd like nut butter live um when you when you order a bowl um but from here i'll pass it on to teague as well um and thank you very much all right thanks craig hello everyone i'll i'll keep it quick um and close this out but if we could please go to the next slide and and by the way craig just gave you the equivalent of uh in and out um animal style secret menu there with the live butter so please uh please have fun and utilize that if you try us out um, Craig mentioned we absolutely try to perfect and focus on doing one thing well, which is the superfood bowl. Um, we did want to just show you quickly that there are some other items um, available on our menu. Um, very grab and go friendly on the go um, uh, for going to class, going to the gym, um, going back to your office. 
Um, you'll see our blue bites there on the left. Those are pretty much a, a house made um, kind of energy bar um, in small bite size um, package right there. Um, our chia parfait, um, Craig mentioned the chia pudding on, uh, as a top layer on the bowl. That's really popular. Um, you don't see the color blue naturally found um, in the environment very often. Um, this is a blue spirulina algae that we use. It's a very high quality ingredient that's very high in antioxidants. And we use that to um, turn our chia pudding blue. Um, we also have some coffee and kombucha on tap. Um, some of our favorites, we rotate the kombucha flavor periodically. Um, mm -hmm. But those are just some additional items other than the bowl um, that you can try out. Uh, next slide, please. And perhaps um, most importantly, where can you find us? Um, mm -hmm. So you'll see the little BB circle there. Um, we are at the, the, the new sixth college, uh, the North Torrey Pines Living and Learning Neighborhood. I'm very excited to be a part of that amazing project um, that uh, it's, it's humbling to see how much work probably went into that. And we're just one small little corner of it. Um, and so thankful to be a part of it. But there you have it. We're there kind of right on that. Um, I believe that is Ridge Walk, um, kind of on your way to Remac and, and towards Muir College. Um, you'll see us on the corner there. Um, right now we are open just Monday to Friday until kind of school comes back into session, um, at which point we'll kind of expand our hours um, and most likely on the weekends as well. Um, but in a nutshell, that's Blue Bowl. Um, and we're so thankful to be a part of uh, the, the campus community and kind of bring Craig and I full circle back on campus. It's a, it's a great story for us personally. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about us. I'll turn it back over. Great, thank you so much, Teague and Craig. Um, definitely gets me excited to check it out and come see your location and get a snack. So with that, I would now like to move into our Q&A portion. So I'd like to invite our panelists who are participating in our Q&A to, to uh, turn your cameras on and we'll get started. And just a reminder of our format today for some folks. So folks had the opportunity to uh, um, submit questions in advance and we're also looking at the questions that are coming in now. We won't have time to answer all the questions, unfortunately, but we do log them and we use them to guide our FAQ on the Return to Learn website. So one last thing before we start the q and I just want to introduce a couple people that we didn't hear from during the uh, presentation portion. So I'd like to welcome Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer Pierre Rie, Vice Chancellor for Resource Management and Planning Gary Matthews, and Angela Socha, Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing. So with that, let's kick it off with some questions. So Chip, I'm going to send this first question to you. Is it better for people with compromised immune systems to get the vaccine versus not getting it at all? Absolutely. Um, the um, uh, people who are uh, immunocompromised do make immune responses. They don't make immune responses that are as strong as people who aren't immunocompromised. In addition to making antibody responses that we measure as neutralizing antibodies, they make killer T cell responses. Uh, and those definitely benefit people and decrease their likelihood of becoming ill. Uh, that's why the current recommendation is that people are immunocompromised receive an early booster dose. Great, thank you, Chip. Okay, Angela, a question for you regarding when you're exposed to COVID. So this person asks, if you are exposed to a person who tested positive for COVID and you are vaccinated, should you get a COVID test? Yes, we recommend that you get a COVID test three to five days after the exposure, or if it's after five days, as soon as you find out. And then your quarantine period should last up to seven days if you get that negative COVID test and you're without symptoms. Also be very mindful to monitor your symptoms after exposure and think about who you come in contact with. If you happen to live with someone who is chips that immunocompromised, more vulnerable, you may wanna assume some masking in your household with the possibility you might convert. So do think about those you're around, but you can move about masked and very safely and do that COVID test and monitor your symptoms. Awesome, that's helpful, Angela, thank you. Pierre, this is a question for you. Um, you've spoken about this before, but it's a common question we're getting these days. And the question is, will staff return to campus plans change with an increase in Delta variant transmission? Oh, yes, we, we, we changed the early guidance. Remember way back when, when we were hopeful for a fantastic fall, <laughs> it seems like a long time ago, we had this magical September 1st date uh, for everyone to return to campus. Um, some of us had been on campus, um, of course, through the pandemic, but uh, some of us had been remote. 
Um, and we moved away from that. And what we said was, it is really the operational needs driving the return, the timing of the return to campus, the, the, both the, the nature of it and the timing of it. So, as I said, we are folks um, who uh, have been on campus nonstop and, and they continue to do so. And we're very grateful. Uh, we are folks who have been remote and um, have to come back uh, because we are, now have um, 20,000 students or close to who are going to be in residence and many who are going to take in-person classes and that's different from last year. So that triggers a different uh, set of needs. And then we have folks who are able to stay remote for the time being and we encourage them to do so. But the decisions have to be made locally uh, because there is nothing more different than, you know, the Department of Psychology versus, um, you know, a utilities plan versus HR versus ITS. And I can go down and down. We are such a multifaceted organization. It has to be very local. And we have to empower our supervisors to make these decisions based on needs and then communicate with their staff. So that's uh, that's what, what's happening right now. All right, thanks, Pierre. That's a helpful reminder about kind of where decisions are being made about certain things. So I think that's good to give some examples about that. Terry, this next question I'm gonna send your way. So this question I think could be interpreted in a couple of ways. So I'm gonna send it your way. What guidance is available to navigate the potential interpersonal points of disagreement re COVID-19 uh, indoor policies? So I think this person could be asking maybe about differences in interpretation of the policies or necessity of the policies. So what do you think about that? I think it's a really good question, Hallie, and one that we're getting in a number of different ways. I think the key that folks need to do um, first is to not try and split hairs or try and find loopholes. In a time of a pandemic, this is the time to interpret rules liberally because we do want to pr protect everyone and provide as much safety as possible, right? So, you know, there are different feelings in society, if you will, around masking, around um, being vaccinated and everything like that. And those feelings are best left to yourself. Uh, as it relates to engaging with your colleagues, follow the rules. And like I said, don't try and slice and dice. Well, I don't think my thing is a meeting or an event. So I'm going to go ahead and do X or Y. Don't do it. Why, why take the risk? What ultimately is your, your gain in that moment uh, versus what is the risk that you're posing to yourself or others in that, in that environment? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't think about it. Don't try it. Keep all of that to your personal time, and I suggest you don't do it then. But the best thing to do is be liberal in those uh, safety measures. Wash your hands twice if you need to. Wear a double mask if that makes you feel comfortable. But don't slack or do something less than uh, given the environment that we're currently in, because the goal is to continue to keep the campus safe for those who will be returning on site because of their um, support and obligations to our students, to our teaching, to our research mi mission, right, to our hospitals, et cetera. For those who are going to be on site, people need to be thinking about the best way to keep things as safe as we've been able to keep them over the last year and a half. So the key is to not try and find the loopholes and to follow the rules, right? Thank you, Hallie. Thank you, Terry. So Angela, a couple questions for you. So masks have been a topic today and, and continue to be a topic for us. So an attendee wants to know, um, will masking still be required in the fall given the vaccine mandate? We're gonna to need to mask inside. That is very, very clear um, because those aerosols, which the virus is transmitted in, um, do accumulate in indoor spaces, which is why we are a little different about indoor behavior than outdoor behavior. In the outdoor space, we're encouraging masking whenever you're in a crowded situation. Take advantage of a mask, protect yourself. Moving about campus easily, going from one place to another, a mask is really a personal choice and not required at this time. And make sure you're using the right types of masks. We really want to encourage that you have a well-fitted mask. Uh, there are N95s, which is what you use in the healthcare space. You can also now get them commercially. They're readily available. They are the tightest fit. Um, you'll notice that when you wear one, it's very, very snug. KN95s similarly are great at protecting you from aerosols as well as droplets, a pretty tight feel. And the other thing you can do, which is very good, is to use a three-ply surgical cloth mask. You'll see those around. They're very easy to get and then cover that with a cloth mask because that gets an extra layer of seal. The idea is a pretty tight seal around your nose and your mouth. You want to have that covered. 
So you read my mind. That was my follow-up question, but I will just bring up, um, you described how it needs to be tied around your face. So what about things like gaiters, bandanas, plastic face shields? Do any of those work? No, they really don't help. And the plastic face shield that is open at the top and below really doesn't give you a whole lot more. It doesn't give you a lot of protection. So um, please stick with those three variations. Um, and if you don't have a cloth mask or, and a surgical, one or the other is better than nothing at all. Please take advantage of that and keep them readily handy. Good advice. While I have your ear, uh, just a few minutes ago, you answered the question about what should vaccinated folks do when they know that they've been um, mm -hmm. exposed. So I'd like to follow up and say, well, what should unvaccinated folks do if they right. find that they've been exposed? Thanks. And it's important to remember there is a difference here because the unvaccinated individual is a much greater chance of converting and acquire the infection after an exposure. Therefore, they should stay in place, which means they shouldn't come onto campus. They need to notify their supervisor. It's a different situation here. Um, similarly, students, we want them to stay in place, stay in their residential. They'll actually be moved if they're a resident on campus. Uh, living in undergraduate housing or with other individuals outside of their household, they'll be moved to quarantine housing. Uh, Off-campus students should either stay in their residence or move into off-campus housing. And we provide that for them as well. So it is a stay put situation for that seven day period. You also wanna monitor symptoms and you do get that COVID test day three to five. So a little different set of instructions. Thanks, Holly, for that. Great, thank you very much. So some questions about events have come in. Um, so I'd love to pass to either Allison or Jill. Um, can you say more about what constitutes routine business meetings? Um, for example, the question came in, are student organizations allowed to have indoor meetings of less than 25 people? So Holly, I did um, ask Dr. Mahaffey and her team in Student Life to put together some specific meeting guidance for our student organizations so that we could get this posted on the return to learn side and um, make it a bit more manageable for all of our colleagues who work with student organizations. We want to encourage our students to have the opportunity to come together in person. You know, my recommendation would be that we encourage our students to meet um, outdoors in an outdoor setting um, or work in a, a larger, larger room where they can be physically distanced in mass, but they need to be able to conduct their student organizational business and, and be in community together. So we should have something posted um, probably by Monday at the RTL site. Awesome, thank you, good to know. Another question related to events, um, this person says, for on-campus events, what is the process for verifying proof of vaccination or negative COVID test results for visitors? So we do have an event scheduled outdoors uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks that will also serve to be a bit of a pilot for us in this regard. But similarly to the way we managed our commencement activities, you know, we invited uh, through um, uh, multiple communication channels so that people would be well informed. We invited our visitors to provide a proof of vaccination uh, as and or a proof uh, within 48 hours of a negative COVID-19 test. I think we understood from some of the counsel that we received on this matter that as long as our uh, participants were well aware of what the expectations were by the event organizers, the event organizers could ask for, again, proof of vaccination as the uh, attendees enter the event or proof of a negative COVID-19 test within 48 hours or the participants could be turned away. Jill, is there anything that you'd wanna to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, no, I'll just say that this is um, still developing, right? We're, <laughs> sometimes we're building the airplane while we're flying it. And in terms of exactly what type of materials people are looking for, um, I would say that everyone's familiar with the paper card, that would be acceptable. And you might also consider um, looking for a smart health card um, that the state of California offers, which is a QR code that includes that vaccine information. Um, and then for, and I'll ask my uh, medical colleagues on here to back me up if I misspeak, but the negative test results should be from a PCR or from an antigen testing. Thank you very much. Another question, um, Allison, this could go to you or Angela, you might also want to weigh on this. This attendee asked, how will students with long COVID symptoms be supported through the academic year? We work with students who are managing all number of health situations through the course of their education. And our, our deans of student affairs, our assistant deans of student affairs in the graduate division work closely with the student health and well-being cluster to put together 
a care plan for that particular student and our student affairs colleagues uh, work with the faculty who provide an accommodation um, in partnership with OSD and other partners on campus. So we will apply the same approach uh, for our students who may be managing uh, symptoms um, related to COVID-19. And Dr. Sosha, what else would you add to that? That was perfect. It's like any other medical condition. The vast majority of students will get over this quickly and be able to resume, but there will be a few that may have some long-term issues to deal with or for you know a period of time. And we'll just follow the normal medical processes with OSD and the academic teams and we'll get we'll take care of the students. All right, thank you both. Gary, this question is for you. This attendee asks, should we expect to see sneeze guards or other physical barriers in our work locations when we return to campus? Uh, thank you, Hallie. The answer is yes, particularly if they're there now. Um, in transit, most of the fleet has been uh, transformed with sneeze guards, particularly for the safety of the operators. Um, and many offices and service areas have had plexiglass placed in, in front of uh, customer facing areas. I, I also think that there will be opportunities to work with facilities management. If you've got questions regarding to a specific office or area, uh, and they can certainly be contacted through the return to to, to learn works websites to uh, do an assessment of the office. Keep in mind that it's not only the plexiglass, but it's also the airflow involved with it. Uh, I heard aerosols mentioned several times and kind of floats it in the air. So the plexiglass will help, but it's also an assessment of what the airflow is like in that area. Makes sense. So it would be dependent on the area and that folks can contact your office if they, you know, want to learn more, kind of get an assessment. Great. That's Terry, correct. This question is for you. As supervisors, what actions do we need to take when the dashboard is live and we see staff who uh, show as not compliant? Thank you, Hallie. And I think this bears um, repeating and repeating and repeating because as we all know, folks need to hear things a few times before they hear it the first. Um, but if you are a supervisor who sees um, uh, your staff and they show up as red, non-compliant on the dashboard, what you need to do is contact your local HR office. That's what you need to do. You do not need to reach out to the employee directly because the employee may very well be in compliance in that they've submitted an exception or a deferral to the process. Or it may be that there are other conditions that would otherwise show them as non-compliant when they are actually compliant. So let local HR interface with campus HR and we will sort that out behind the scenes without uh, uh, providing any um, privacy information that isn't supposed to be disclosed. And then we will let you know as a supervisor what, if anything, you need to do next. And in many cases, it will probably be that you don't need to do anything at all because there are circumstances that don't require the employee to engage in parts of the uh, requirements that would show them as non-compliant otherwise. Okay, thank you. Chip, this is a question for you. So we got quite a lot of questions coming in uh, during the event and before related to boosters. So uh, you covered some of this in your presentation, but I'm gonna send it to you anyway. When will the COVID-19 booster be available for staff? And another person wants to know, will it be like the flu shot that's updated every year or something we get on some kind of regular cadence? Those are great questions. Uh, as we're having this meeting uh, right now, they're meeting in Atlanta to, or perhaps virtually in Atlanta to uh, decide um, what the recommendations are going to be. The speculation is that they're gonna recommend people start getting vaccinated five to six months after their second um, initial uh, um, vaccination. Uh, and um, that uh, will mean uh, things will probably start around the, the first part of September or mid-September. Mid the current vaccine boosting plan is to use the same vaccines that were used to vaccinate you. The uh, Pfizer vaccine is the one that will be used primarily uh, the good news is that it's uh, effective against the Delta variant, and you get such a big boost from it uh, when you get a third uh, injection. Uh, it covers you very well for the Delta variant. Uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are working on um, tweaking the vaccine so that the vaccine looks a bit more like the Delta variant, uh, and they'll be bringing that out sometime later in the year or early next year. Uh, I wouldn't wait to get it. I'd go ahead and get boosted uh, when your time is up uh, because we know the boosters work really quite well uh, and we go from there. People who are um, immunocompromised 
are uh, able to get vaccinated as we speak, and I would recommend they do that. Uh, and um, as we continue to hammer away at it, I think we'll uh, see fewer and fewer of these breakthrough cases. So I, I think I heard you answer this in your answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, just to make sure I'm interpreting it, right? So the, the question is, will boosters likely be specific to the original vaccine you received? So if you got Moderna vaccine the first time, can you only get the Moderna vaccine for your booster? Ah, okay, I missed that question. Uh, no, actually, the um, right now, most of the boosters will likely be the Pfizer vaccine. Back when there were problems with uh, shortages of the Moderna vaccine in the spring, uh, people were allowed to get the Pfizer vaccination uh, if, they, if they'd already gotten their Moderna first shot and needed to get their second shot on schedule. And there were no problems with that at all. Uh, there are also a number of uh, medical journal papers published now about getting the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine after receiving a vaccine like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So mixing and matching uh, uh, works really quite well. And um, uh, I think we'll have to do that uh, as you move ahead in some people. You don't need to actually match what you had before. Thank you. Okay, Terry, another question for you. This one's about um, return, return to campus. How were decisions made about requirements to return to in-person work? Specifically, what factors were considered? The overarching factors um, are related to the mission of the particular work unit, right? So the first thing people have to remember, because uh, I know there are sensitivities to folks who've been offsite uh, for a year and a half, and if they're being asked to return on site in any capacity, uh, because they feel like they've been completely and in, 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 um, totally effective working offsite this entire time. That may very well be true, and we're very appreciative of all of that work. The, the shift in certain things returning to on site means that certain folks have to return on site to support those operations. So, for example, we're going to have more in person classes that requires some support in various uh, operations, right? Um, we're going to have um, other things opening up on the campus that weren't open during parts of last year. So because of those shifts, that, that um, then obviates the need to have other shifts related to the folks who support those operations. So the first question, um, or the first answer to the question is, it's about the mission. So as supervisors, managers, leaders are looking at what the actual operations are for fall ready. Right, what things will we, we be doing? Will it be on site? Have we reimagined how we do work that requires some things to be on site, some things to be off site? That's that first assessment. The second um, assessment then is based on the, the population of personnel that I have, who needs to do this work and how, how often do they need to be on site to make sure the work is done effectively to meet the customer's needs that they're, um, that they're serving. Then there's a, an assessment of, Knowing that, how do we then make a plan where we can still uh, have as much collaboration as necessary, the appropriate um, availability of services, whether it's extended hours or weekend times and things of that nature, and then thinking about what makes the most sense for uh, the work that's being done by that operation. After they've made those assessments of what, you know, the maximum flexibility they can allow, then those conversations happen with the actual staff about what their requests are within that. Um, in some cases, there's not a lot of flexibility within what those initial offers are. A supervisor might be able to say, I can allow you to be off site for two days, but it has to be either these two days or these two days, given the um, areas that they serve and the population that they need to um, provide support for. So there's really a whole lot that goes into it. I think the first thing that I want people to understand, though, is these things are not easy. And supervisors are not in the business of just trying to make people mad. That is not what the goal is. The goal is to meet operations and they have to make hard decisions, but they are open to having discussions respectfully about what people's needs are or ways that they might have suggestions of doing the work differently. So engage your supervisor respectfully, ask questions about how they um, approach the process, make the suggestions where appropriate and go from there. But understand that ultimately the decision rests with your supervisor and you have to at some point, no, you have to let go and let them make the call and let and you show them who you are and, and shine in your way. And then maybe they make an adjustment because the operations dictate a, a shift um, is more appropriate. But be patient because this is not easy to layer on all of these different requirements and to make sure that the customer needs are also met in the midst of everything else that's going on. So 
um, hang in there and be respectful of everyone during this process. All right, thank you, Terry. So we had several questions come in related to wastewater testing. So this first one I'm gonna send over to you, Gary. Is wastewater, is wastewater detection still being added to more buildings on campus? Well, thank you for that question, Hallie. Yes, uh, we have close to 200 wastewater sampling sites across the campus now. More will be added. Um, it truly depends on the access points and uh, accessibility of the, the wastewater within those lines. Uh, but yes, it's currently being tested. It will continue to be so. It has proven to be a, a highly effective way to manage the, the virus, at least the detection. And most importantly, as, as folks have been talking about self-help and people doing what they need to do to protect themselves, they should clearly understand that the university has gone to great lengths with world-class researchers, uh, teams to test the wastewater. It's not necessarily the world's most pleasant job, but we're doing it to keep people safe and we will continue to do so. I should add that um, the 20,000th 20, sample was tested yesterday of wastewater. So uh, it's it's really been something that's been done very, very, very actively. It's quite the milestone. All right, so the follow-up question, Chip, maybe you wanna take this or maybe Angela. How are we tracking virus shedding in buildings where wastewater is not currently being tested? We don't have a tool other than our surveillance testing programs, which are very effective uh, and work very well. We know that our unvaccinated community will be testing quite a bit for virus. And then we're working through the frequency or need for the vaccinated community. So we'll be, uh, you'll be hearing more messaging about that. So the surveillance program is a very important tool. And the other one is that daily symptom screener. If you have symptoms, please get tested, vaccinated or not vaccinated. Um, sometimes these symptoms can be mild. Uh, access to testing is readily available on campus free. All the vetting machines starting tomorrow will be up and operational. So take advantage of the symptom screener and uh, surveillance testing. Good reminders. Thank you, Angela. All right, so um, Terry, kind of a follow-up question in, in your uh, question that you answered earlier, you kind of talked about the importance of open communication. So this question is, do you have any recommendations about collaboration in the office during this time? So if there's lots of doors that are closed and you know people are maybe trying to stay far apart from each other, you know, how do we communicate? So in, the, in this environment, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question that, you know, once people um, start to return uh, on site, they'll realize, oh, goodness, the only way that I can have my mask off indoors is if I'm in an enclosed office space. So I'll just close my door. And then you think, wait, wait, why am I on site if my door is closed all the time, right? So then you need to really think about, you know, some signage on your door, knock before entering, and that way people know that they can enter, that you actually have an intentional dialogue with your employees and let them know, like, look, I'm closing my door, and it's mostly for your benefit because I'm on a Zoom call and I don't want to be disrupting you all day. Also, having an hour long or two hour long Zoom call with my mask on when I have the ability to close my door isn't, you know, necessarily the best um Thing to do. So I'm going to remove my mask and close my door, but I want you to know I'll be available at X you know, time so that we can still collaborate and engage. The key is to remember that you're working with other humans who do want to interact, but there needs to, it needs to be done safely. So to the extent that you can have your door open and have your mask on sometimes, do that so people know that you are accessible, because what's the point of being on site if you're not actually going to be accessible to your staff and, and engage with your employees? That is a great tip, Terry, thank you. So I'm thinking the next one is probably gonna be our last question for the day. Um, I think this question probably will go to Angela, although I'll open it up to whomever might wanna answer it. Um, this person wants to know, can you give us specific instructions for when a student indicates that they test positive for COVID-19? So maybe a student tells you that they test positive for COVID-19. What is our very first step? What should someone do when they hear that? In contact with student health because student health should have provided that individual with the medical support they need. If not, we want them to call student health because through that, we also access other support for that student, whether it's isolation or quarantine housing, support from the basic needs team, support from the uh, deans for student affairs for academic needs. So I think the first thing is to make sure they're getting the medical care that they need. 
All right, that makes makes a lot of sense. Well, with that, it's 3.15, so we're gonna, or just about 3.15, so we're gonna wrap our staff town hall up today. First, I wanna thank all of our panelists. We covered a lot of ground today, and I'm just really grateful for all of your uh, expertise and taking the time to join us today. We didn't get to all the questions today because there are so many submitted, but we are looking at them and we are using them to inform our um, FAQ on the Return to Learn website, which you can check out. I'd encourage you to keep an eye out for a survey um, about this town hall. Your feedback really helps us cover the material that you wanna cover, host it when you wanna host it. So your, your feedback continues to be really valuable as participants. Um, and with that, we'll wrap up today. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon and we'll see you at our next staff town hall. Thanks everybody.